I'm Wen Shorta, and this is an any percent speedrun of King's Quest, Mask of Eternity. Today, we'll discover how speedrunners turned this 3D action adventure game into the most broken entry of the series. The runner is Chuck Grody, the current world record holder. It's a segmented run, meaning that it was recorded in parts and then edited together. The speedrun skips the opening cutscene, but all you need to know for now is that everyone in the Kingdom of Daventry has turned to stone, except for Connor, our character, who has picked up a mysterious object. By the virtues, what vile magic has invaded Daventry? And what is this? There's a lot to take in here, but we waste no time at all coming up to our first glitch of the run. And no, it's not Connor's jump distance. By going in and out of first person and running up against the wall, Connor will slowly inch into it, eventually clipping through. You'll see this a lot in the run. The wall clips were first used by Korzik in late 2013, but this was done with backflips, which were much more difficult. Korzik would refine the technique, and Blue Screen 18 would discover the method of switching perspectives to make it work. Chuck makes it look easy, but there are subtleties to the wall clips, like how much to move Connor back and forth, and how much of the animation to let play before switching perspectives. Connor's ridiculously long jump is the fastest way of moving, at least in areas with enough vertical clearance. Chuck is now hopping his way to Castle Daventry, which, like the rest of the game, looks very different from the previous King's Quest entries. Why is that? By the mid-90s, the gaming landscape was dominated by 3D titles, and Sierra felt the King's Quest series needed to evolve from its two-dimensional roots. As Ken Williams said in 1997, the traditional adventure game is dead. Why hassle through all the literary pretense when most of today's gamers just want to blow something up? This must be Castle Daventry. Now to find the king. We actually don't need to find the king, just the ashes from a burnt out torch. If you were looking forward to seeing Graham and his family in this outing, you're going to be disappointed. That's not the fault of the speedrun, they're just not in the game, aside from these portraits and Graham turned to stone. Next, Chuck is going to have to clip back out. Clipping through this wall skips a long sequence of climbing and obstructing the water. Some of the walls are a little trickier than others because they have multiple layers, so we're going to need to perform the clip multiple times. In case you didn't notice, there are enemies in this game and there is combat, but once you get out of range, most of the enemies just sort of forget about you. Our next stop is a wizard, the only other human in Daventry who hasn't been completely turned to stone. We need to talk to him and normally we're rooted to the spot while we get a big exposition dump. Instead, we're going to start a conversation, end it, jump away, click on the wizard to start a conversation again, save the game, reload, and then show him an item. This is going to let us regain control of Connor while the conversation continues playing out. Alive. Chuck's going to walk up to the wall of this church and then move the camera in such a way that he can grab a candle through the wall without having to go inside. We're then going to grab some mushrooms, which are health items. Next, we're going to acquire a grappling hook from the second story of a mill. What you're supposed to do is go all the way across the map, fight through some enemies, grab an axe, come back, chop down a tree to stop the mill, and then use the millstone to jump up and grab the grappling hook. Instead, Chuck's going to do a bit of acrobatics. First, a backflip to land on top of the door. Next, we wall clip, but not all the way through. You have to stop swapping perspectives right as Connor starts clipping and let him finish the step fully. This has him in the perfect position to do another backflip, then turn, and do one more. All this movement is really tricky and can lead to some pretty significant time loss if you screw it up and fall back to the ground. 
Now that we have the grappling hook, we can clip back out the way we came. There's a certain distance where the wizard becomes inaudible. Chuck has to be careful to cross this threshold while Connor is talking. I? Sounds! If he does it when the wizard is talking, the conversation halts, and there's a warp at the end of it that won't happen. Chuck's going to continue hopping towards a mausoleum, where he needs to steal the ring of a deceased knight. Clipping through the wall skips a battle and a cutscene with the knight's ghost. The wizard just told us that the thing we grabbed in the opening cutscene was a piece of the Mask of Eternity, and we need to find the other four pieces to restore truth, light, and order to the land. I will need your ring in order to achieve my quest. At this point, we're just waiting for the wizard's conversation to wind down. Once it's over, the game conveniently teleports us back to the wizard, who gives us a magic map. Sadly, it's not as cool as the map from King's Quest VI. This one just slowly reveals the area as we walk through it. I am grateful, sir. My destiny is clear. I shall prevail. Good wizard, I beseech you, give me guidance. I have discovered the portal to the dimension of death, but upon entering it, have encountered a foul beast of darkness. By the dimension of death, it is said a monstrous shadow bane guards the threshold, and that it cannot be slain by any weapon. It can In case you missed it, the shadow bane was this thing that we ran past after completing our first wall clip. Clipping into that area skipped a cutscene where we would have met it and been forced to flee. The wizard gives us a grocery list of items to create the Ring of Illumination, and what do you know, we already have all those things. Ashes of a torch. Aye, Sir Wizard, twill be done. Sir Wizard, I have gained a ring from a noble knight long deceased. Aye, tis good, lad. At this point, I'd like to mention that Korzik was the first person to route the game, and if I don't mention the origin of a trick, it's likely from him. Credit should also be given to Matthew Barrich, Blue Screen 18, Bulby Pop, Were Tiger, and of course, Chuck Grody, for making the run into what it is today. Now, lad, behold, by all the spirits of the light, brighten the darkness of the night. been immeasurable. May we meet again in better time. Now that we have the ring, we can move on to the dimension of death by, what else? Glitching through a wall. By the way, if you don't like glitches and want to see a glitchless run of the game, you're going to have to do it yourself. I'll put a link in the description to an article written by Chuck Grody on how to get the game running on modern PCs. In fact, before that guide, the game crashed so much that every run on speedrun.com used to be a segmented run. Even now, crashes do still happen, but they're much less frequent. The Dimension of Death is the largest map in the game, and it has a ton of puzzles that require backtracking, making note of symbols, platforming, all sorts of tedious stuff. We're not going to do any of that. First, Chuck jumps over a sidewall to avoid a cutscene. He then aggros a skeleton along with a few of his buddies. These guys are no fun, unlike some of the skeletons in the other King's Quest games. What we're about to do is a backflip on top of the head of this skeleton in order to bypass a gate. This skips many of the time-consuming puzzle sequences and battles in this region. As for the rest of the puzzles, they can be skipped by jumping over the river Styx. Die, 
die, you immortal. The river Styx is supposed to instantly kill you, but if you go to the edge, it's only deadly in the middle. Chuck's gonna line up precisely and thank the gods for Connor's gazelle-like leap. Here's another angle from Korzik where the trick is easier for us to see. Chuck does it in first person because that way he can line it up more easily. Now that we're on the other side of the river, we can make our way to the swirly spiral at the end of the level, which will take us to the swamp. And that's the Dimension of Death, one of the shortest levels in the speedrun. Where am I now? A swamp? Ah, the swamp. What a lovely shade of green. There is a piece of the Mask of Eternity here, you know, one of the things that we need to finish the game, but later on the game doesn't actually check that you have it, so we don't need to pick it up. Instead, we're going to a scaffolded structure, using the mushrooms along the way to survive some damage from the swamp. This is why we needed to pick up the grappling hook earlier. Connor's been working out, apparently, and he's kind of a show-off because he only uses one hand at a time on the rope. We're going to climb up another wall to get to the top of the structure. Behind these doors is the only item we need to get out of the swamp. You're supposed to defeat a monster and take his hand and then use it to open the gate, but we have the power of clipping. Normally you have to do some platforming once you get in here, but the puzzle is disabled since we didn't come in the way the game intended us to. At the end here, we grab a golden ladle from inside the chest, avoiding a fight with two monsters inside the room. When Chuck clicks on the door, it triggers the cutscene that would tell you you can't get in, which puts him back on the other side without having to clip back through. Then Chuck is going to perform the first instance of fall damage canceling. If you equip and unequip a weapon, the animation gives you invincibility frames. A fall from this height would normally kill Connor, but Chuck times it right and goes on hopping like nothing happened. You may have noticed that Chuck doesn't actually have a weapon at this point, so what he equipped was his fists. It's probably more accurate to say that the button readies and unreadies an attack. Next, we're intended to kill an evil swamp witch and then raise a gate and get into the castle. But of course, we're going to skip that. Instead, we're going to use the ladle we just picked up with a cauldron inside the castle by clicking it on a specific spot in the wall. It's important to know that the camera can be moved with the mouse or the keyboard using a modifier key and page up or page down. Chuck moves the camera into the wall with the mouse and then uses the modifier key plus page down to bump the camera even further along the horizontal axis. The game registers our interaction with the cauldron and then teleports us inside. We've now purified the swamp water, and King Mudge, the snail, comes out to thank you. The game assumes that you've killed the swamp witch by this point, but her character model is still here. The game is trying to make Connor exhibit some manners by walking out and greeting the gross swamp thing personally, but since we never raised the gate, we just kind of bump into it and give up. Who are you, sir? Snail? I am King Mudge. This swamp is my realm, and all here are my subjects. I understand you slew the vile witch. Aye, I did, sire. <laughs> How wonderful. I couldn't tolerate that old biddy, especially after she poisoned our lovely swamp. But now, because of you, our water is pure once more. I wish to express my supreme gratitude, Sir Champion. I humbly accept your appreciation, sire. But pray, 
Can you give me counsel on... Stay. We must quickly devise your exit. Now, champion, behold. The portal to the underground realm of the gnomes. Wait. Where are you going? Now we're going to hop on upstairs. This is where we would have killed the henchman and cut off his hand to open the gate earlier. It's also where we would have received another mask piece. Instead, we're just going to jump off into the loading area for the next region. Connor actually would die here from the fall damage, but because he's in the loading area, the game whisks him away to the underground realm of the gnomes. This must be the realm of the gnomes. It should come as no surprise that we're going to immediately turn and clip into a wall. This skips a long sequence of throwing rocks on pressure plates and fighting a bunch of enemies. Now we're on top of the tunnels that make up the underground realm of the gnomes. It's really dark here, so let me turn the brightness up a bit. Okay, that really didn't help too much, did it? There's not much to see here, so I'd like to take this time to thank my patrons. If you enjoy this type of content, consider visiting my Patreon page where I post behind the scenes videos and director's commentary. This region is one of the most difficult of the run because there's a lot of precise clipping and platforming. Part of what makes controlling Connor so difficult is that there's no strafe or sidestep button. We're going to clip back in, and Chuck has to move very carefully, staying in the middle of the wall, which is difficult because Connor likes to walk at an angle. Doing this correctly skips a nearby dragon, among other things. The only thing we need here is a lodestone that we're going to give to a character later in the level. What purpose would that lodestone and hovering crystal serve? Now that we have the lodestone, we need to do the wall clips in reverse. This is very difficult because you have to stay inside the east wall. If you move too far west, the dragon will attack you. Too far east, and Connor will fall to the terrain below. This method of skipping the dragon was first described by Matthew Barrich in the comments section of Korzik's 2013 run. We're going to get into this corner, turn Connor 90 degrees to the left, clip in, then clip in again, and turn another 90 degrees to get back into the tunnel. Up next, Connor's going to run into a wall that he would normally knock down by rolling a boulder into it. Tis too dark. I cannot see. Connor may not be able to see, but he can certainly phase through walls. We're going to encounter some scary looking manta rays in a second, but they don't do much damage and we can pretty much just run by. In the next section, we're going to find some Indiana Jones style boulders. What we need to do is wait and then run across when the time is right. It's also possible to move around this earth elemental, but he can hit you on the return trip, sending you into the boulders, which are timed perfectly to stun lock you and then repeatedly roll over you until you die. I have gained the lodestone wise. This is where we use the lodestone we got earlier. The gnome needs it to power his machine, and in return, he will open a portal for us to get to the next region. This guy also really wants to share some lore with us, but we quest at our own pace. Sucks. Wait, mortal. I must explain. On our way back, there's no real way to avoid the boulders except to wait for them to roll past at the right time. Now it's time for another wall clip to put us back on top of the tunnels.
And up next is one of the scariest jumps in the whole run. Chuck is going to have to line up right and take a blind leap of faith, just barely making it to the other side. After making the jump, we're back to our old tricks. Next, we're going to beat up some mummies, which really doesn't pose much of a challenge. And then after we've sent them back to the grave, we're going to do another damage cancel off of this ledge. Manta rays, skeletons, boulders, and swamp witches are no match for our hero, but the scariest enemies of all are the frequent crashes. This upcoming scene transition is very prone to crashing, and so we take a safety save. Alas, in what scorching land have I found myself? We're in the Barrens, Connor, also known as the Lava Level. At the beginning, we'll grab some crystals, healing items that are more effective than the mushrooms. As you might imagine, we'll be skipping most of this region, including a fight with a basilisk. We're also, thankfully, skipping some frustrating platforming sections where it's very easy to fall in the lava. There are some enemies coming up that we could try to fight, but we're severely underleveled and under-equipped, so instead, we use the power of hiding behind rocks. You burn or a pit of flames. The dwarf on the right can still see us and tries to hit us, but doesn't seem too worried about friendly fire. Unfortunately for him, that means we can safely grab the fire arrows from his dead buddy and then take him out. Next, we're going to clip into yet another wall, but we're not going to walk through. Instead, we do a backflip and fly up to the top of this area. The first runner to use this was Were Tiger in August of 2019. Previously, runners would clip into the fortress and have to fight an enemy or two. Kind of like the river Styx in the Dimension of Death, we find a tiny patch in the corner where Connor is safe and drop down. And guess what? It's time to walk through walls again. This particular wall actually has three layers, so it takes a little bit longer than normal. But once inside, we can solve this puzzle without being attacked, and we grab a pipe cap that we need to leave the region. If we angle ourselves just right, we can grab another pipe cap without having to open the cell door. We're also supposed to let Frieza, the Snow Queen, out of the other cell, but with all the clipping we're doing, that's not actually necessary. A piece of the mask. The mask belongs to Lucrito, underling. Give it to me. To the contest, then. The contest, apparently, is to see who can run away the fastest. There appears to be some sort of boundary the enemy can't cross, because he just leaves us alone. I suppose he's too intimidated by Connor's wall-busting abilities.
Here, Chuck is going to put the pipe caps on each of the pipes and then stand in just the right place where he can press this button from a distance. Normally, you're supposed to fire an arrow at it. By acting quickly, he's managed to avoid a fight with a henchman and gets whisked off to the frozen reaches. <sighs> this is a frigid land, sure. The first thing we're going to do in the frozen reaches is to jump off a cliff and perform a damage cancel. Chuck's going to skip a big section of the level by taking the perfect line through an icy lake that deals constant damage. You're supposed to fly a crystal dragon over it, but Chuck has enough healing items to just power on through. There are also pockets of the lake that will instantly kill you, so Chuck has to be careful to avoid those. The frozen reaches are even more barren than the barren region we just came from, so there isn't much to see as we hop our way towards a stronghold, aside from some yetis that will attack if you linger too long. Much like the dwarves, Chuck can use cover and snipe the ice orcs from a distance. He intentionally leaves one of them alive, which we'll get back to later. Next, Chuck is going to use the grappling hook to climb up the side of the castle. At the top, Chuck avoids the grate in the middle because walking over that will trigger a long cutscene. But get ready for this part. Now that the guard is dead, we can loot a key from the ground. If Chuck had killed this guard earlier, another would have just appeared in its place for this cutscene, which is why we left him alive. Now here's my favorite glitch of the entire run. Chuck's going to clip into the wall, take a step in, and then turn the camera. Turn Connor. Do a backflip. Bring up the tooltip with F1, hold down the modifier key to move the camera up, and then click the key on the door. This unlocks the jail cell, which transports Connor up top for the cutscene. Thank you, brave knight. Now I must return to my flock and bring them to order. Aye, your majesty. Not me, you, Thork. So instead of fighting Thork, we're going to grab that icicle and then run away. And in one of the few puzzles we actually complete in the game, Chuck's going to drop an icicle into the gap in the door. A bad place for such a wide gap. I have an idea. Then we're going to melt it with the fire arrow, and apparently Thork's biggest weakness is cutscenes, so we're perfectly safe for the moment. We're going to run outside, grab the ice crossbow, then equip it and freeze the water. Aha! Success! Now we have an ice lever. Chuck's going to run away from Thork a little bit and use the lever on the slot next to the locked grate. Aye, it worked. I hope to not break. 
once we enter this little room, Thork apparently loses interest in fighting us because he's just going to watch as we demolish this ice thing. Look at that, so spectacular the game had to show it to you three times. Aha! Another mask piece! The mask belongs to my master. It will not aid you. It will not aid you either. While Chuck bravely fights off this bad guy, let's talk a little history. Like I mentioned before, Sierra was pushing to move their 2D adventures into 3D. Technological advances had worked well for Sierra in the past, but this time they were up against a wall. The initial 3D engine they used had been designed for flight sims and not action adventure games. New oversight after an acquisition and a merger also meant difficulties for the project. Mask of Eternity went through three different production phases. A lot of team members, frustrated, ended up leaving. Sierra eventually developed their own in-house engine to get the game finished. After all the hardships and delays, it finally released in November of 1998, the same week as a vastly more famous action-adventure title for the N64. Above us, there's a Hydra, but having no armor and really no good weapons, I think we'll just clip through the wall instead. The next level, Paradise Lost, is kind of like a gatekeeping level. It's just there to make sure you have enough pieces of the Mask of Eternity. Though it really doesn't do that correctly and doesn't care if you actually have the piece from the swamp, but whatever. This level is so short that most players would have spent more time loading it than actually playing it. I'm not kidding either. To save space, the game only puts the files for the current level on your hard drive. So each time you change levels, the current level's assets get deleted and the files for the new level need to be copied from the CD-ROM to your hard drive. These days there are patches to avoid this problem. Eternal, thou hast completed thy worldly tasks. Thou art now prepared for entry to the realm of the sun. Behold. Connor's going to begin the level by straight up murdering this guy who is just minding his own business. By my oath, am I really here in the realm of the sun? Indeed we are. The enemies in this area are very strong, and since we're so underleveled, it's easy to die here. Chuck's going to use some healing items and mostly try to avoid getting hit. Another strategy is to use an invisibility potion, which is what Blue Screen 18 did, but you have to kill one of these enemies to get it. Bulby Pop was the first runner to get through the Realm of the Sun without using invisibility and not wearing any armor. What is the power of truth? I know not the answer. I shall seek it. The door asks for the power of truth, and the answer, obviously, is walking through walls. Fun fact, the game needs to be running in direct 3D in order to clip through the walls in this region. If you're running it in software rendering mode, wall clips don't work, which took Chuck a long time to figure out. 
We're going to keep walking through the gauntlet, obviously skipping any of the puzzles we're intended to do. Some of them are pretty cool, like uh, pushing a lectern into the center of a room, or, oh dear god, a sliding puzzle. They put a sliding puzzle in the last area of the game. Ugh. How gainest thou? I shall see. By this point, you may be curious about how the game was received when it came out, especially due to its troubled development cycle and the fact that it was so different from the King's Quest games that came before it. Mainstream publications gave it some pretty good reviews, with GameSpot writing that, even with all its flaws, it's a fun game to play. But many adventure game fans were less than kind. Adventure gamers wrote that the game doesn't quite succeed in being either a pure adventure or a pure actioner, so it fails trying to be both. Still, you can find many people today who remember it fondly. Speak thou of order. I know not how, yet. For our last door, can you guess what we're gonna do? Well, you'd be wrong. Instead of clipping through it, Chuck backflips above it. This is the final room in the game, and the home of the final boss, Lucrito. Our next goal is to assemble the mask on this altar. Because we didn't enter the room normally, we skip a cutscene where Lucrito puts fire on either side of these stairs. We're not supposed to be over here on the side, which is where the fire is supposed to be, and that's probably why the devs didn't test what would happen if you did stand here, which is that Lucrito gets stuck, and Connor can punch the air wildly to get through the first few phases of the fight. You don't even have to be facing him and your punches will land. This is also why Chuck never picks up any melee weapon during the run, because you don't need one. Connor's also supposed to have a fully upgraded suit of armor by this point, which is why the visor keeps popping up in the cutscenes. We're gonna run around where the fire is supposed to be. Punch Lucrito in the face a few more times. and put another piece of the mask on the altar. We've got one more round of punching, and then it's time to put the last two pieces of the mask on the altar. Now that the mask is fully assembled, our goal is to knock Lucrito into a portal that's going to appear behind him, which is a lot harder than it looks. In addition to the armor, we're supposed to have a sword with hundreds of damage points, but since we don't have that, Lucrito can one-shot Connor. Or he would be able to, if not for this trick we're about to see. Chuck abuses Connor's invincibility frames by walking forward and then taking individual steps back, punching in between. If the punches connect on the right frame, Lucrito gets knocked back and we've won. If not, Connor will die, as you're seeing here right now, and you'll have to do it again. This also happened in one of Chuck's previous world records, and this is one of my favorite rants of all time in speedrunning. 
Why won't he just go in? It's every single time I'm on pace. What is wrong with this, dude? He won't go in there. Look at this. Look, it doesn't do anything. You can't beat the game. You can't beat the game. It won't let you. The game won't let you win. It won't let you win. I want to use God mode. I'm going to allow that in the rules, man. Because this game is glitched. It's broken. It's a broken game. What is wrong with this? What is wrong? What is wrong? I, I'm losing. I'm losing it, guys. I never want to run this game again. As you can see, this can take quite a while, so we're going to fast forward here a little bit. There's one. And two. The mask restored, Lucrito defeated, everyone turns from stone back to their human forms, and all is right with the kingdoms. If you enjoyed watching this video, I'd also recommend my History of Quest for Glory 1 speedruns. I break down the tricks, strategies, and follow the years-long efforts of runners to get the time down as low as possible. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.